So hi everybody, you just heard uh, Jefferson Bailey explaining what uh, archive it and internet Net archive developed and then uh, the archive unleashed team and now we come to the in some ways real users of uh, all these functionalities developed by the archive unleashed team and by archive it uh, and uh, this presentation is uh, based on a paper uh, that Jan Milligan presented at the WorkNet conference uh, a few months ago and which was entitled you should not need to be a web historian to use web archives lowering barriers to access through community and infrastructure, you can find it in the WorkNet paper on the WorkNet uh, website. And in this paper, what is interesting, there are plenty of things that are interesting, but is that Jan uh, Milligan is distinguishing between three kinds of personas, a computational humanist, a digital humanist, and a conventional historian. And in our work to team that I will present, uh, in some ways we are all uh, a bit of this kind of personas, but you can move from one to another. Let me explain. So the Awak2 team uh, was um, composed uh, after a, a court um, program call by the Archive Unleashed team in 21. And uh, we answered this call and we were uh, successful. We are very thankful to uh, the Archive Unleashed team with a project which uh, aimed at uh, studying the uh, huge IPC collection related to the uh, COVID-19. This collection, which started in uh, 20 with the pandemic, uh, was gathered thanks to the collaboration of more than uh, 30 members of IPC. Uh, so this is a huge collection, but also an international and a multilingual one. And you will see that it's raising a lot of uh, issues. We are six members in this team. And uh, for example, we have a computational uh, scientist. But being a computational scientist or even a computational humanist doesn't mean that you have a lot of experience in uh, web archives. And this is not the case of uh, or a member who is dealing for the first time with uh, web archives. And if you don't understand exactly what web archives are, it's very difficult also to uh, understand how you can conduct an efficient distant reading, of course, uh, on the data that uh, you uh, access. A digital humanist, we are mostly we could say digital historians or digital humanists in this team, uh, but you can be a, a digital humanist for some kind of a study, for example, a very um, at ease with a network analysis, but a real beginner or newcomer with other uh, kind of analysis like sentiment analysis. Or you are not using the same tools, you are not using the same methods, and so you are always uh, trying to improve your skills to learn a bit uh, more. But what is interesting with a digital humanist is also the fact that uh, they are also interested in digital hermeneutics. And in some way, it's a bit like uh, the conventional historian who is uh, bringing a lot of skills related to source criticism. And when you want to conduct uh, a scalable reading of uh, data sets, you need also uh, to uh, conduct some source criticism. Why? Because uh, you will have data that are a bit too noisy, you will find gaps, you will find uh, silences in the data, and it's very important to know what you can and what you can't do with uh, the uh, data. So to have a heterogeneous team, as you will see in the next slide, may be a real asset. First, we needed to have a collective, a collective work on this data set. It's impossible to go through all this data uh, alone. But you also need to create a kind of a trading zone and to negotiate with your partners because some may be more data driven, other more research driven. Uh, some will start by uh, digging into the data, other will start by research question. And in our case, one uh, main research question, which was selected by the IPC through a vote, uh, was uh, that we suggested, of course, was the topic of uh, women, gender, and, and COVID. But even with the topic, you have several ways of designing a research. You have to find a shared interest. For example, some of us are more interested in homeschooling, others are more interested in uh, topic modeling and identifying, for example, women and the world that are close to uh, this one uh, in the COVID collection. Others may be uh, more interested in, uh, for example, controversies like uh, pregnant women and uh, vaccine and so on. And you have, of course, to connect also your digital capacities with uh, the state of the art, with academic capacities in order to define a shared outcomes and goals. Uh, for example, a computer scientist 
artist and a digital historian don't publish in the same uh, journals. You have several journals that may be at the crossroad of his interest, uh, but you have to deal with it as you have to deal with the temporalities of a research. For example, uh, if the um, uh, digital uh, humanist is waiting to go uh, deeper into the data, he has also to wait a bit, for example, um, in order to allow uh, the computational humanist to create uh, subcorpora or samples that are very relevant and it takes time because you have to face a lot of challenges uh, when trying to uh, create, for example, a corpus related to a pregnant woman within a big data set related more generally to uh, the uh, COVID crisis. Let's move to the next slide. Just to mention, if we come back to the title by uh, Jan Milligan, uh, lowering access through community and infrastructure, that uh, finally you have uh, several questions. Lowering access, what does it mean? The technical access is for sure lowered uh, thanks to uh, archive to the ARC uh, interface, to the work uh, by the Archive Unleashed team, but you can't lower uh, the questions that are related to, in some way, the cognitive access. You have to understand what uh, web archives is, what uh, the collection allow, and so on. You have a need for sure for a community, and here we have a strong community. Uh, we are benefiting, for example, for mentorship uh, two times per month with the Archive Unleashed team. We can also ask questions to the IPC. We conducted an oral interview uh, with the IPC through uh, the WorkNet project, which uh, allowed us also to better understand how this uh, collection was gathered and uh, curated and, and so on. And which infrastructure? Of course, we mentioned ARC, and uh, it was already mentioned several times uh, in the presentations by uh, the Archive Unleashed team and by uh, Jefferson, but you can go beyond and you can use uh, several tools and connect it to uh, the um, Data set may be, for example, so, uh, tools like uh, Panda, Giphy, and so on, but also, for example, Jupyter Notebooks and so on to share also uh, information, knowledge, and this is very meaningful. So you may have really several levels of skills and of use that you can also uh, deploy, develop uh, within uh, this kind of, of study, but uh, Frédéric will explain further. Thank you, Valérie. Uh, once we, we connect with the archive it, um, portal, uh, we have access to uh, not the work files um, um, that are making the corpus, but the right CSVs. Uh, those CSVs are, uh, th there are quite a lot of them, and, and with different kind of information here, we will take um, the example of the, um, the file we, we, we have used a lot, uh, which is basically the, uh, a file with the, the, the plain text of web pages each web page that are in this corpus, in the IIPC uh, COVID-19 corpus, uh, will be aligned in the CSV, uh, very well structured CSV, um, uh, which means that uh, it's a CSV with more than 8 million lines. Uh, that was in January, in last January, it should be more today. Um, the file sa size is then, and more than nine gigabytes and that's compressed so when you uncompress it it's uh, far more and uh, it's uh, it's so big that at least from the historian's point of view um, even if there's no velocity here uh, we are in the realm of um, big data uh, big data here i will define it as you cannot use your own computer your personal computer to uh, analyze this data set um, and on the contrary um, well, like this tweet is ironically saying it, uh, basically it, it's not fitting in memory, not at all. Uh, so we need to find uh, ways, we, we needed to find ways to analyze this data and to find a computing infrastructure. And that's, uh, we, we need to switch to high performance computing, which is not necessarily easy for historians, even with some coding skills. Um, we also have to uh, had to um, to work on the optimization of the code, uh, and we also had to find a way uh, to work together with um, uh, to work together, uh, and that was the use of notebook and GitHub. But I will go back to this a bit earlier. Uh, 
One of the important things to get along together, to work together as a team, was the organization of a datathon a few weeks ago. Um, and um, as this datathon was a bit a way to give life to this trading zone we, we are talking about, um, and to confront a bit our different skills and our different point of view. That was complex, as you can see on this picture. Um, that was complex be between we, we need to find a way to articulate um, data-driven and research-driven approaches. And there are many, many ways that we can articulate both. For instance, we can filter the data set through keywords that are um, defined from the research question, or we can do topic modeling on the whole data set and then just isolate the topics that are linked to gender and women to, um, to take this, um, this um, example. Um, we, we, our workflow in the end, um, as you can see here, is really an articulation of the, those two approaches. We start with the, the typical data-driven big data approach just to get um, to get a bit more familiar with the data set because this corpus is quite complex because it was made um, by several institutions across the world uh, with sometimes different policies, uh, of different archiving policies. Uh, so we start with this overview of the data set that is uh, made, that is data driven. And then we go progressively with things that are more focused on specific themes, depending and, and tools or analyses, depending on what we want to do and the question we are asking to, the, to this um, um, data set. Um, so, uh, a few words about Jupyter Notebooks. Jupyter Notebooks are quite important in the way we are working because it's fundamentally a way to allow historians with few or no digital skills to understand what's happening um, when other historians or computer uh, computing scientists are um, are writing code. So it's a, um, an interactive way to understand uh, the code. The Archive Niche Toolkit is really um, preparing this, they, they, they wrote several notebooks that we can use as a starting point, and that was really um, a great thing to uh, to be able to use those, those notebooks. But as the data funds, Jupyter notebooks are also a way to give shape to the trading zone and to our research. If I sum up a bit our concrete experience with the Archive Unleash Toolkit and Archive It, um, the iterative process of the way to, um, to, um, to move forward through a trial error process is uh, really um, important um, and also helps to shape the, the, the trading zone. Um, then we um, alternatively worked on samples or of the data set or on the whole data set. So samples made of made through keywords, so a, a filter data set or the whole data sets, and that's linked to the fact that we are trying to articulate data-driven and research-driven approaches. Uh, the Archive and Niche Toolkit is obviously lowering some barriers. Uh, it's easier to work with CSVs that you can load into Python scripts with a single line of code, for instance, but some barriers remain very high, and, that's, and those barriers are linked first to the massiveness of the data of the data sets and to the and, and to the, the, the to our skills basically that are quite some sometimes a bit low. And then there is the importance of the data fund to really get along together and work together as a team. Thank you.